set to go. Well, welcome. Uh, hopefully, uh, you should see on your screen now uh, a little flyer uh, with the Animal Science Building in the background, University of Illinois Feeding Webinar, uh, March 28th. We have uh, Dr. Dick Wallace and Dave Fisher online also live, which means they can contribute and commits and argue and clarify and assist us as we go through our presentation today. Uh, this is our 2010 series. You'll notice there are two other webinars listed there. March 22nd, the focus is going to be on forages, and then April uh, uh, 5th will be a milk quality uh, uh, focus group, and uh, Dave Fisher will lead the March 22nd, Dave and, uh, and Dick Wallace will lead the April 5th. Uh, all the web seminar webinars are held from noon to 1 p.m. Uh, Central uh, Standard Time. I guess by that time it would be Central Daylight Time, and you only need to register once for all three of them, and there is your website uh, addresses if you need them as far as that goes. Well, we welcome you. We are pleased to have you on board, and hopefully you will find the next 30, 35 minutes useful and informative for you. I think the, the focus is going to be on profit potential. That's what we're looking at here in the dairy sector. Uh, we're simply saying we came off a very tough year in 2000. 2009, as all of you know, and the question is, what are some of the things that we should be looking at, some of the decisions made, some of the alternatives, and then a few of the current feed challenges we're seeing, seeing here. This is what we'd like to uh, run across here in, the, in the, our 35-minute time period, and then a quick update on microtoxins, and uh, hopefully that will fill the 35-minute slot very nicely, and then, of course, welcome your comments and questions at any time. You can type them in. Uh, Jim will be monitoring them here, but we will not answer them until we, uh, we get through the, the, the presentation. Well, some of you know, certainly uh, Dave was at some last week. We've had a series of focus meetings in Illinois. I believe we've had six so far and one more to come yet, and so what has been some of the comments and questions we've been hearing in February and March in 2010? And here are some of the things that have popped up. And again, we are not going to spend much time in these. In fact, Dave Fisher may comment on some of these a bit later on. Uh, a question on is, uh, are corn crop feeding as hot? Or is it lower in energy value than maybe we anticipate? That could be a reflection of bushel weight. That could come into play here. It could reflect a little bit of some of the disease challenges this corn plant has had. It could reflect maybe some drying conditions. We had some farmers drying corn that were in the mid-20s, bringing it on down at this stage of the game. And so some farmers are asking that. And we've raised that question here at the University of Illinois a little bit too. And that is, uh, for some reason, it looks on paper, our rations look spot on. And yet when they put a little bit of more corn in there, we got a little bit of a kick as far as that goes. So that's been a common question. I'm not sure. All I know is you have bushel weights below 50. I know a normal bushel weight is 56 pounds and below 50. Uh, most of the research would say that you're going to have less starch in, the, in, that, in that feed and you would therefore have perhaps less room and fermentable carbohydrate in the feeding program. Uh, Dave and I have had lots of questions on baleage. Uh, the questions are pretty straightforward. How wet? We're staying modestly wet. Other universities go dry. We're sitting around 45% dry matter. We think that's kind of the magic spot. Our guys, I think Dave, our take was they like even go wetter than that. Uh, I just get a little right. nervous uh, that uh, wetter, you may start seeing some accumulation of, 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 mo of moisture actually in the in the plastic bag. Most of these are continuous wrapped. They're not doing the marshmallows or continuous wrapped at this stage of the game. Dave, do we hear a figure like 5 to $7 per, per bale? Is, is that the number you were hearing for wrapping yes. these big bales? Yes, about seven uh, all total by the time you wrap. Depends if they are putting them in the tube or if individual wrap. About seven for the tubing. Right, and 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 uh, and and and, at the, and then the big question comes in processing them. The, the interesting thing is most cows will seek this feed out. So <laughs> when you talk about processing, you almost got to make it not sortable because they will go after it. Uh, one dairyman reported that putting the baleage out there, that actually the cows would leave the TMR and go eat the baleage. That's not a big surprise, but it also probably indicates that maybe his, his TMR isn't the world's most palatable TMR either, as far as that goes. We just think we're going to see more of this, especially in herd sizes, probably more modest size herds, 200 less cows, as a way to get long forage into the diet, not having to buy hay, we'll touch on that in here in just a few minutes, nor putting straw in the diet that they can keep the, the diets pretty honest using using the baleage. We've had questions on balancing for amino acids and different software programs. Uh, my only comment there would be that last year when the price of milk went down and milk and protein prices were below $2 a pound, right now they're sitting at about two uh, 260 per pound, then uh, even if 
if the cows responded to amino acid balancing, there was a question of payback on it. In fact, I know of two very large co-ops in Minnesota and Wisconsin literally um, went away from amino acid balancing because they thought they were getting about 18 cents in added protein value and were costing in the mid-20s to add the amino acid to the diet to get it balanced. I think that's just changed around a little bit. Uh, another question has come to play, at what point do you look at balancing amino acids? My number is probably somewhere around a three and a quarter to three pound, three and a half pounds of butter fat, which at Holstein's gets you up around 80 pounds of milk. It's probably going to get you around 65 to 70 pounds with jerseys. I think at that point, a model that's going to predict metabolizable protein, both in looking at microbial synthesis and the changing RUP values, would be a, a good choice as far as that goes. We just did that today in our class for tonight. Uh, we are running our, um, our, 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 on our, our class uh, on, online. We've got about 37 students in there. We are running three software programs using the same ration in all three, and it'll be eye-opening to the students because we ran Spartan, and now we ran NRC 2001, and it'll be very, it's very interesting to see the differences with the same rations. David, I'll let you cover that one a bit later in your class. When you talk, uh, there's been interest in new grasses, different grasses. Uh, Wisconsin is coming out uh, under Sander, and, and, and uh, Dave Combs, of come out with some new information on grasses and um, interesting grasses coming back into legume-based uh, uh, forage feeding programs. And Dave, I guess we'll let you cover that maybe hopefully on the 22nd as far as that goes. One of the challenges we're running into this fall is that uh, because of the lateness of the fall, there's not nearly as much winter wheat in, and there's a question of how much straw that's going to be available for next year. We ran across a dairyman in central Illinois that has gone back to corn stalks. I smile because corn stalks was very popular back in the 70s when I was in Minnesota. Uh, corn stalks were dry cow program and heifer programs, and uh, this person actually uh, takes a, uh, a device and, 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 uh, and, uh, and beats up the corn stalks uh, with a flail, lets them out there for two or three weeks. So this fall was not a good, was not nearly successful. Allow those corn stalks to dry out, and then he bags them. He actually bags them in a bagger. He chops them, puts them in him much like he would a silage, and he basically has a, a bagged, chopped corn stalks. And his bagger is set up to the point that if they're low on the damp side, he will put a, put a little probe on it. And he said he's really had good success with this, especially for his dry cow program. Almost a poor man's straw. We're hearing 100 to 120 dollars a ton for straw, and they claim it's 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 going to at least in Illinois, it's going to stay right up there. They claim there'll be pretty good straw coming out of Nebraska and Kansas, but some of that straw, of course, doesn't get harvested as far as that goes. The last thing before we get on to more more, more what I call focus was levels of rumenzin and uh, we have now seen farmers not in Illinois but other states up at the 500 plus grams milligrams excuse me wow that's a that's a lot of rumenzin. Uh, we do see a more common uh, the uh, 375 400 milligrams I think Dick with U of I we're sitting at three and a quarter are we not do you recall how much uh, menenzin we're feeding here at U of I? And uh, that's right. Um, oh, a wonderful comment. They said, can I go faster? No, no, no. No, I, they want me to go slower. I will go slower <clears throat> because I can go faster. I can actually go faster than I'm speaking now. I can go 400 words per minute but burst up to 600. So hang on to your seats and, uh, and, uh, and away we go. Anyway, the uh, rumenzin levels, uh, we basically look at higher levels in those herds that have modest to strong butterfat tests and we titrate it right up because as the level of monensin increases, the, uh, the, uh, the, the efficiency and the improvement and, and, uh, and replacing starch also increases with it. So actually, you get more bang for your dollar. Typical number we had uh, given to us from a good resource is about a penny per 100 milligrams. So if you're at the 300 milligram level, you're looking at about three cents per cow per day. If you're going to do some titration, or in other words, moving up or down, we suggest doing it in 25 to 30 35 milligram levels and let the cows diets and rumens actually rumens adjust to those higher levels for a week to 10 days and then watch such things as milk components milk yield manure scores those kind of things to see if in fact um, with the um, with the uh, with, with changing the levels of rumenzin so anyway, uh, I had another comment that says velocity. We love the velocity, so we'll, we will go a little bit slower. We'll go a little bit slower. Well, I just uh, looking ahead, I thought leading into our uh, our last uh, 25 minutes of our, our of 
our workshop here today. Uh, th this has been a very fluid uh, slide. Uh, basically, we thought we were going to have $15 Class 1 milk prices back in November, and here we are in March, and we're looking at $13 to $14 Class 3 milk. Really good news compared to when it was sitting down at $9.90 uh, back here a year ago, exactly at this time here, but we were hoping we were going to see more $15 and $16 Class 1 milk, and uh, it just frustrates our dairy producers, and even myself, to say what's what's driving this. But anyway, uh, that's kind of the hand we're dealt, so I think it could be a little tight. The next couple of months are going to again be tight months. We see that the uh, the, uh, the the milk program and now now has numbers again for later this spring, which means it's below that target price. So again, uh, smaller farms would qualify uh, for that uh, for that payment. Forage prices are are, uh, are interesting. Uh, historically, alfalfa 90 cents per point of relative forage quality. Although if you get out to Kansas, Nebraska, some of this good hay at 170 and above, it's almost a dollar a point. A dollar a point. We're hearing at Dairy Days, excuse me, Dairy Focus meetings just a month, just a week ago, of 160, 170 a ton for bringing that hay in. Corn sides at 35 dollars a ton. Pretty typical type number at 33 cents, a uh, 33 percent dry matter. Uh, corn prices, if you look to the future, they're talking $4 uh, bushel corn and suggesting that if the price of oil stays uh, uh, bullish, that that will bring the corn price up because we'll see more ethanol coming back into the program. And if many of you read that there's some legislation trying to go to 15% ethanol blends versus 10%, and of course that would certainly increase that demand as well. Uh, fuzzy cottonseed is... Uh, uh, I said was bullish. Actually, that should be bearish. Uh, our guys were saying, Dave, I think they said 240 a ton is what they're buying cottonseed for last week, if I recall correctly. And um, yet, if you look at the, the Minnesota Wisconsin numbers, maybe that is transportation. They're still sitting at 260 and 270. I did have a dairyman near Madison, Wisconsin call me last week. He already locked in his 2010 2011 cottonseed gin run at 201 and his stored cotton seed at 230 and uh, that to me sounds like a very good price we just ran with these feed prices through our feed valve last night we were looking at about 260 a ton break even fuzzy cotton seed so certainly those were good prices we had a smile because uh, the farmer called me the day after he bought it and wanted to know if it was a good price. And, uh, you know, it seems to me you might want to ask and answer that question before you bought it, but uh, that's okay. He's from Wisconsin. We understand at that. Soybean meal looks like it keeps dropping on down. Most of you have heard big crops sitting in South America. We're hoping to see some 300, maybe even 280 a ton a ton for, for 48 soy. So that, that one looks to be a, a pretty good buy. Again, distillers, grains, and corn gluten tend to keep that feed somewhat honest at this point. The last one is probably most disturbing, and, and, and that is according to USDA, uh, there are now 49.2 heifers per 100 dairy cows in the United States, compared to last year at 47.2. That equates to about 200,000 more heifers out there, over eight, over 500 pounds in weight, and of course that's just about the exact number that went out in the CWT program in 2009-2010, or actually 2009. So uh, people argue that has to do with sex semen, and it probably is related to that, but yet according to the Florida researchers, the real impact of sex semen comes next year. They're thinking maybe 500,000 more heifers. So, uh, interesting time. So let's move on to our, our feed one, and I know we have a couple of questions in the queue, but uh, uh, basically we'll catch those uh, right at the end. So hang on there, we'll do that. I thought we'd just look at economics of it. I thought that this, uh, some of you that were at Dairy Days, you will recognize these next two slides here. Uh, this is that magic cow in Illinois that produces 70 to 80 pounds of milk, and she's black and white. So these would be my feed prices here. Uh, I have low-balled low this in two areas. No, notice over on forages, you, if you're feeding any amount of high-quality alfalfa, silage, or hay, you can't do it at six cents a pound of dry matter. You have to be at least 50% corn silage, if not even a little bit higher a percentage corn silage to get that price over there. If you come down to byproducts, some of that has to be corn gluten. You can't get that if it's fuzzy cottonseed, because fuzzy cottonseed is more than 10 cents a pound for dry matter. On the protein supplement side of the equation, I've got to have at least half distiller's grains to get there, because obviously soybean meal isn't there as well. So uh, those are the prices I have in there. Uh, if you can, if you can match these. Prices, 
prices, you've done very well. Because we're going to just show you a couple examples here from Illinois here that we picked up back in January of 2010. Notice the magic numbers there, about $4 per cow per day. That's not a very effective number, and about 50 pounds of dry matter. I then go to the next slide, and I then translate that into what I think are the key numbers. And if, if, if there's something you say, well, well, what did you learn at the dairy day? I mean, or at the, at the, not the dairy day, excuse me, but at, at the uh, webinar, that this would be the keeper slide. It says that if you can put the groceries in front of the cows at 8 to 9 cents per pound of dry matter, you've done a very, very good job. Very good job. So and, and so now you saw where the eight cents came from. It came back from fifty pounds of dry matter divided into four bucks. And so you can see. So if you're at ten or eleven cents since that last slide, someplace you've got big numbers, big numbers. And I'm not saying they're wrong. It may be because you've got jerseys. We expect jerseys to be about a penny higher than Holsteins. It may be because you're a little more aggressive on additives, forage quality, especially alfalfa. First crop last spring was crap, and so uh, it, it, it might have been related to that. So eight to nine cents is an A. You come down to feed cost per hundred weight of milk. I'm saying five fifty. Four dollars uh five dollars will get you an A plus. I have not seen anybody who got there. I did see one last week though that got close to five dollars on it. Notice uh, that's one of your take home points. Every time I go from eighty to seventy pounds of milk, these last three numbers are worse off. So it reflects that even when our price of milk now looks like it's dropping about a buck a hundred, boy, let, let, let these uh, these high producing cows go because the economic uh, measurements are favorable. So 550 would get you an A for feed cost per hundred weight. That one is really impacted by such things as milk yield, shrink, uh, feed losses, uh, lead factors, uh, empty feed bunks. They, they, they all relate into that one. Income over feed costs with $14 milk. Hopefully uh, we're going to be more like 16 but it looks like $11 would be a really good number now uh, next month maybe $10 would be a good month as far as income over feed costs that is my least favorite number although I know a lot of states love them and the reason I don't like to I don't, I don't have a lot of favor with this number is I can't control that 14 15 16 dollars I, I don't control that you control feed costs because of feed selection a level of production reproduction all the kind of things come into play and then comes feed efficiency also known as dairy efficiency this is pounds of three 3.5% fat corrected milk per pound of dry matter. And a 1.6 is a beautiful number. Man, if you can get your herd at 1.6, hooray for you, hooray for you, hooray for you. Most herds are sitting around 1.4 to 1.5, which means that there are opportunities as well. We're just going to show you two PowerPoints, why that feed efficiency is so important. If you look at this PowerPoint over there in orange, you can see if I go from 1.4 to 1.6, that, by the way, is a very large increase on, on, on feed efficiency. That's worth 49 cents per cow per day. That's just a huge number. I would argue most of my Illinois dairymen can find a tenth of a point. So if they're at 1.45, they go to 1.55, then that's an extra 20 uh uh, 22, 23 cents more income per cow per day. It, it's really huge. Uh, right now, we're struggling at the University of Illinois for some reason. We've got a new experimental diet in, and these cows are going through huge amounts of dry matter, and the milk is dropping. So the feed efficiency is really uh, being cranked uh, the wrong way on those cows. And I think we think we know why those two things are happening out there, but certainly becomes an important factor. Here's some uh, Illinois farm data that was picked up by Jim Endress at our Dairy Days. And this just shows you it's a very busy slide. You can see there are five Holstein herds identified A through H. And then there is a, 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 a J herd. That would be a Jersey herd over there. Uh, when you got nothing else uh, tonight, uh, you can look at these PowerPoints if you want, give you a little flavor of how these numbers jump around. But you can see that basically nobody really beat my eight cents. You can see on the second line from the bottom, the green number, about eight and a half cents is the best number we've actually seen out there. Uh, the first farm over there is one of our very best farms in the state of Illinois. He's using all the feed additives, so he, he by choice, he is elected to go with that. He also has the highest milk yield sitting up there as well. But, and he, but he also has one of the highest feed efficiency. So you can see those those numbers don't always track identically together in terms of either being very high, very low. They all jump around because different factors enter into them. So again, to me, that's a great report card. In the webinar, I would say this this would be one of my take-home messages, and that is how competitive are your people? If you're an extension agent, I know I have several of you online that are extension agents, several of you that are veterinarians. Uh, how is your clientele? Some of you are feed companies. How are you measuring up on, on, these, uh, on these measurements? This came... Uh, next PowerPoint came from Ohio State 
and this is done by Norman St. Pierre. I like this one. We just we just found it in a paper about a month ago. And in fact, Jim shared that with some of our kids in class. This shows you uh, what you might say target feed tar uh, target yields and feed efficiency. So say if you've got a 60 pound herd average, yeah, you're never going to get the big number because you don't have enough milk uh, there in the numerator. If you get down to 80 pounds of milk, a lot of you are there. You can see our 80, our 89 herd was right on the money, right on the money as far as that goes. So you can see these relate back pretty well. The only thing I don't understand, because I went back and checked this paper, he was using 3.6 butterfat versus 3.5, and I'm not sure why Norman did that, why he wouldn't go to 3.5 with that, but uh, he's from Ohio State, and I guess if you're number one in the Big Ten, you can do that kind of foolishness. But anyway, we won't pick on him too much. Then let's move into another area, and I know we've got a couple questions in the queue, and but we're, we're going to keep moving on. Uh, one thing we thought we would do on the webinar and saying, let's, let's look to see what we learned from last year. One of the lessons we heard about, and unfortunately happened, and I'm sure it never happened in Illinois, but it probably happened in Minnesota. You know how they, those crooks are. Anyway, it simply said, we're going to pull back minerals. Either we're going to feed less mineral, we're going to pull organic minerals, uh, trace minerals out of the program. We're not going to feed any minerals to heifers because, you know, they're just, they're just heifers. And this is a neat little slide that I borrowed from a colleague that says, as you go from green, which is the goal, which is what I call as an optimal program, which we'll define here in just a minute, into the orange. The orange is where evil things start happening. And you can see, uh, unfortunately, these are not unique to just minerals. Uh, immunity comp uh, the immunity is compromised. Well, you know, uh, uh, damaged corn this fall will affect immunity. It affects digestibility and enzyme function. It affects fertility. If our mineral programs aren't spot on, it affects growth in, in, in our livestock. So certainly we're saying you don't want to be in the orange. And the problem is, I don't know where you are in the orange because, you know, if she would flick her tail twice to the right, that would tell us something. Or stop her left front foot three times. But these are pretty generic type things that happen on farms all the time. Most of us will see the deficiency signs. You know, all of a sudden we got 20% of the cows not cleaning because we pulled out, for example, the organic selenium at this point. Uh, the hoof trimmer says, man, the hooves are really changed, and that's because you pulled out the organic zinc, for example. So here are our numbers on the next slide. These are our macro numbers. Um, we're simply saying uh, slightly different. So basically an NRC 89 listed there, NRC 2001, this would be in the ration dry matter, and our numbers are on the right. And you'll notice they are a little aggressive in some areas and identical. We're a little higher in calcium because we want to make sure our older cows have enough available calcium for absorption. That usually means you're bringing in some dical or limestone to get that job done. We bumped up the magnesium because most of my dairymen are using some source of added oils or fats, and there is some work in the NRC suggesting it can soap or tie up as far as that goes. A little higher in sodium primarily because it's, it's going to come from your, your buffer, so usually not a problem. Notice both sodium and potassium have stars by them, which means under heat stress you're going to go to higher levels. I think the data is pretty clear on decad balances on, uh, on cows under heat stress, and the other numbers are pretty straightforward. This PowerPoint looks at the trace minerals. And we got two slides, actually. You'll notice here in the middle, uh, there's two ways to look at this. The Illinois numbers rec are total ration, total ration, what we would have in the feeding program. If you go to the one where it says NRC required, that is the old NRC, we would supplement that. So you can look at us two ways. The first column on the left is what you would buy coming through your trace mineral supplement package at this point. The one in Illinois says based, Illinois tends to around three to five to six parts of copper in their in their forages. That's where the 15 comes from. You can see the same thing on iron. We got a lot of, a lot of iron in our feeds and there's always the question if we if we need to feed that at all. We got about 20 parts per million zinc and manganese in our feedstuffs, and so that's where those numbers jump up a little bit. There are maximums, and I think they're important. That's another story for another day. To me, if you want to get an A, this is the A slide. This would be the milligrams that I would add to my dry cow and my milk cow ration per cow per day, and I would star copper, the second one down, uh, selenium, the second from the bottom, and zinc, which means part of the selenium and zinc is going to come from organic sources. So the selenium would be selenium, uh, selenium methionine uh, as, a, as a portion of that. We are looking at typically on copper and zinc about a quarter to a third of the supplemental sources coming from organic sources. On the selenium about half or about three milligrams of organic selenium to my dry cows and then three milligrams to my milk cows and three milligrams of the inorganic sources to get that up to six 
to seven from our lactating cows. So to me, I think that keeps us in the green. Remember that slide? Kind of keeps us in the green and keeps us going at that stage of the game. Here are some other parameters we have, and we may not get, in fact, I know we will not get through all these slides. We will start cherry picking in a few minutes, but I think if you're asking Hutchins uh, and, and, and Dr. Wallace and Dave Fishers of the world, what, what are some of the things we want to be monitoring? I think age at first calving is critical. Uh, this simply says that if we slow these heifers down because of something we're doing in the feeding program, then that's going to cost me $2 per day once I get beyond that magic time period. And that's probably a Holstein number up on top. The Jersey guys would shave that back at least one, if not two months, to bring them in even at a younger age at this point, and then, of course, pour the coals to them because these heifers will be still doing some growing at this point. The accelerated calf program, in fact, that number is a little conservative now. Mike Van Amberg at a meeting two months ago argued that actually their data would support even a little bit more milk in the first and second lactation on these accelerated high-protein milk replacer or whole milk programs. I want to be very clear to you as listeners that you can use whole milk and achieve that same thing on the accelerated calf program, it'll just cost you a little bit more money right now than uh, if you're using milk replacer and you have a few less additives that you tend to find in the milk than what you find in the milk that you can get in the milk replacers. So that's the accelerated program, typically about $50 up front. And we ran across a calf raiser last year in which that if you want your calves raised on the accelerated program, that you will have to pay him an extra $50 because he said it's costing me more money to get your calf to that weight and I need to recoup that and I think that's very fair. Paul Fricke is the third number down. It simply says what impact does pregnancy have and certainly anything we do in the feeding program, be that uh, uh, pulling cotton seed out of the diet, pulling chelated trace minerals out of the diet, uh, whatever the case is, uh, reducing energy, uh, lower body condition scores, whatever it is. Uh, for every day over 120 days of milk, uh, Paul uh, Paul's data would say about $2 a day cost me and once you get up at 8, so this uh, it's a curve, so it's not a big stair step. It's kind of a curve. It says as you get out to 200 days open. Uh, the, these cows now are costing almost $8 a day because you're not getting the back of the calf and you're losing that extra milk and, 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 and the replacement heifer in the whole that whole area. The next number is another Wisconsin number. So Paul would say, gee, Hutchins, you're stealing from Wisconsin. Yeah, I know. After that basketball game Sunday, we steal whatever we can. Uh, George Shook did this work years ago saying, if a linear score change occurs, and that may be because you pull, for example, a zinc, a zinc out of the diet, then uh, that means about two pounds less milk. The last one is a, a key point. I was at the Hoof Trimmers Convention a couple of weeks ago and they said they really had a tough year because farmers really couldn't pay for hoof trimming and so they trimmed fewer cows per visit or they had fewer visits per month. This is the California data that comes in that says if cows are lame, and by the way, write that down or put that on your sheet of paper, that is a uh, score three. Uh, score three, which means these cows are not physically lame. Uh, they are the ones that have the arched back, do the bobbing with their head. They have the shorter step or gait with it, and six pounds less milk with, with uh, score three cows, and of course a risk of increased culling. So again, that becomes another factor as well. Well, here is uh, some more ones to monitor. We call this cow talk. Uh, Terry Howard years ago used to use this term, and we kind of adopted it. Cows are always talking. You just aren't listening sometimes. So these would be our parameters that we start making feeding changes, and that's one of the, the focus of this of uh, this of this uh, of uh, this webinar is if muns change by three units, then you actually have done something on the farm. Uh, we saw a farmer, and Dave knows who he is, who added some corn size to his feeding program and dropped his muns four units and picked up about five pounds of milk and dropped his butterfat a little bit. So two out of three is not bad, but certainly what he did with his corn silage actually did change. We like our, Some of you will probably want to argue that month number eight is low, but we think eight to 12 is kind of the new paradigm on months. Now we looked at 2009, all Illinois, uh, Iowa, DHI month values, they average around 13. So uh, the normal historical range has been 10 to 14. And we kind of copied this from the Maryland workers say, maybe we can crank the units 
down a little bit lower. And some of my really smoking herds that really are rolling, 90 pound tank averages, good milk components, uh, not unusual to see them in that 8, 9, 10 range as far as that goes. Uh, again, manure scores are useful. You'll see we're going to pick on that here in just a second when we look at microtoxins. And I'll let you read the rest of them. All the rest of them are certainly things if you see cows changing, or you mean they're measuring them by looking uh, at body scores or looking at DHI records or tanks measurements, something is going on. I want to get to our last one, and we're going to skip uh, because we're getting a little bit lower on time. Uh, I will just show this and we'll skip the next three. Some of you ask, may wonder, what, well, what are farmers doing to feed additives? Uh, Hordes Dairyman does a market survey every year. This was January, uh, came out in January 2009. So uh, this 2008 data really reflects good milk prices. And I find this interesting as an extension worker or as a veterinarian or as a consultant or nutritionist, kind of what people are buying. What, what, what j jumped out at me are the yellow ones, Rumenza number at 21%. The lily people would argue that that number is incorrect. A lot of farmers don't know they're feeding it through their feeding program. The number we tend to expect is 40 to 45%. The microtoxin binders, and I know you folks in Minnesota know it's illegal, they won't let you call them microtoxin binders. They're flow agents. Of, uh, Binders, that was back before we had our damaged corn. 14% of the farmers in the survey were using some type of a flow agent. Interesting, 9% were using methionine, uh, it's an amino acid. You and I would argue that's not an additive, but I just wanted to put it in front of you here. I was, I guess, disappointed. I thought the anionic product use was modestly low at, at 5%. And then a fair number of people using mold inhibitors and baled hay at this stage of the game. Well, let's then go to our microtoxins, and that's the beauty I have here, zipping along here. Uh, I uh, notice that this is all really neat stuff. Ah, it's not there. That's interesting. I thought I had microtoxin stuff in there. Anyway, I, I do want to go back and, and just make a quick comment on it. And Jim wants to know if I hid them, but whatever happened, they're not here. We're not going to worry about it. Let's say a quick word about microtoxins. Um, basically, we updated our, our information, and uh, we basically... Uh, uh, have a couple things and uh, are they seeing this? Unbelievable. James, you are a miracle person. Um, l l let's cruise around here a little bit. That's the one I thought I had. You are a good guy. Anyway, uh, this is through February 2nd. This comes from Dairyland Labs. Uh, for some of you that haven't seen this, I think I see Tim Schneider's online. Uh, the word is you folks have a little more excitement out there than, than we have here. Uh, but uh, almost 1,200 samples or 1,100 samples. The bad news, 84% were positive for vomitoxin. But the good news, 5% uh, were at the above the action level of six parts per million. And remember, this is for the total ration dry matter. So if you're high if your corn grain is at eight, and the numbers that we did, and Dave and I were asking that question the last couple of weeks, uh, what are you seeing? A couple of feed companies are doing some testing, and the numbers three and four and five are very common uh, here in uh, in Illinois at this stage of the game. You can look at those other numbers. There's not much action there at this stage of the game. The number that we're using for vomitoxin is six parts per million. Uh, one company, one nutritionist told me, eyes wide open, one lab was reporting all of these in parts per billion. So this farmer went nuts. His sample came back. He had 3,000 parts per billion of vomitox. He thought for sure they'd be tipping over in the barn as he spoke. Remember, that's three decimal points of difference. So actually, he was very, he had a very low level of, of, of Don or vomitox and in it at this stage of the game. What we're suggesting is watch these two characteristics. Watch for changes in manure characteristics. And we've had a lot of winter dysentery sitting in southern Illinois in the last week or 10 days. Uh, days Dave uh, and I picked up on that at, at, at the focus meetings. And then watch your dry matter intake. So if cows start eating a lot and they're really loosening up, or excuse me, eating less and loosening up, that could be a sign. And we'd put, we'd, we'd put, we'd put the binder in and that binder would be, uh, do we, do we lose it, Jim? What we, I, uh, never mind. Um, that binder, we'd be, we'd be looking at the yeast cell wall binder. We'd be looking at the yeast cell wall. So these are like your, your, your moss products and that. Uh, the, what we can find from Arlan Whitlow and a study done reported in feedstuffs here, it looks like that is probably a product that has at least some, uh, some of the yeast cell wall products in it are probably going to be fairly effective on Don and on the, uh, 
uh, on those types of microtoxin. My last PowerPoint, and then we got a few questions. We'll open it up as far as that goes uh, at this stage of the game. Uh, these are the byproduct prices. Uh, I updated these uh, last uh, last night and are, are pretty current at this point. Uh, a very busy slide, but let me tell you what you have, and then you can read it at your leisure. Let's pick on the hot kid on the block. He's on the bottom, or it's on the bottom, distillers, grains. Basically, the break-even price, uh, uh, feed valve three says about 252. If soybean meal goes a little bit higher, that price will go up with it 252. And at our meetings last week, at our focus meetings, you could buy it at the point of production at 105. In fact, a few people even had lower prices than that at this point. So it says you could afford if it costs you 20 bucks a ton to get it to your farm, you could afford to pay 125 a ton, and uh, its value, nutrient values, is worth 252. Now remember. Your cow has to use those nutrients, the oil, the bypass protein, the calcium, the phosphorus. The phosphorus may be questionable because uh, of all the phosphorus sitting in these feedstuffs and the protein sitting in the feeding program. So you can see here in central and southern Illinois, distillers, grains, wet brew, and gluten feed are really good prices. In fact, gluten prices, if you go out to the futures, which I kind of shake my head a little bit on, we've seen you can lock in 80 bucks FOB, $80 FOB in April, which would imply corn prices are going to come down. So, you know, you look, you look at the, the, the futures market in Chicago, and they have $4 on the board, and here you can see gluten at, at $80. <laughs> Pretty straightforward for me. Uh, fuzzy cotton seed, you can see again, uh, break even price actually now with a little higher uh, protein price actually is about $260, and that's about where she breaks. And soybean hulls, uh, you can see uh, price I had quoted last week, $120 a ton. So, again, those two white ones aren't very favorable at this point. Well, listen, I went on here for for my 35 minutes. <clears throat> We've got other PowerPoints that we're not going to use. Um, you can, uh, will they see them? Uh, if they, um, uh, okay, Jim tells me he will post them all yet at, at this stage of the game. And let's go back to our, our um, uh, to our questions down here. Our first question that's popped up here, and again, uh, uh, Dave and Dick, uh, feel free to uh, kibitz in from the sideline here as well at this. What rumenzin levels are they using in close-up and fresh cows with the 500 milligram herds? Paul, I think most of us are sitting around 300 milligrams. Most of us around 300 milligrams. And I find that interesting, Paul, uh, because... Uh, you know, you say, well, dry cows eat 20, 30 pounds of dry matter, and we have 300 milligrams going to cows eating 50 pounds of dry matter. What's the story? And then the story is that it looks like those two numbers, 300 and 500, kind of relate pretty nicely to each other. But then, of course, you've got a lot of the rumen factors coming into play in the, in, in the lactating cow. So I would guess about 300. We were just up in Canada at a meeting. Uh, at Kitchener, and uh, they still have the boluses, and there's some really new technology coming on the boluses. Those Canadian crooks are going to get ahead of us again. They have the ability to not only pay out um, uh, selenium, but they could also pay out other things uh, in, in that bolus. It could be some type of an additive, it could be some type of an antibiotic if it was approved, or some type of dewormer if you're in pasture cattle. They're pretty excited. They could see this in Australia, New Zealand, where you could actually put the dewormer in the, uh, in the capsule and actually pay that out so you could uh, uh, tr treat the cows. Uh, with rumenzin at the same time, deworm them all uh, using the same device at this point. Um, question comes in here. Uh, let, let me read it to you. Uh, when you come to the microtoxin, can you emphasize the importance of a healthy rumen when there is uh, moldy or tox, uh, moldy or, or microtoxin corn? Since some of the microtoxins can be made into can be made into less toxic metabolites in the rumen, anything you, we we could do to stabilize the rumen, reduce sorting, and maintain dry matter intake will help the challenge. And I think Lisa, <coughs> excuse me. Lisa, that's a very good comment. I don't disagree with that. I think that's why we're seeing farmers uh, routinely putting in microtoxin binders and also looking at putting in yeast. Uh, I had one farmer and one nutritionist uh, suggest that uh, 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 using a higher level of yeast product also appeared to help as far as that goes out there in the program. So she's right. Uh, certainly a healthy rumen will do some detoxification. They will reduce some of that, but it also means that uh, they can handle uh, 
handle uh, the microtoxin a little bit better. And so certainly the rumen stabilizers, such things as uh, your buffers, your yeast products come into play. Of course, that opens up the whole question on DFMs. And we are on the sidelines. I know, Tim, you've raised a couple questions here. We're kind of on the sidelines kind of watching watching that and saying, are there going to be some my, uh, DFMs, direct-fed microbials, that are going to maybe help us on some of these rumen challenges with some of these toxins that are sitting out there in the feeding program? Our message, and I don't want to miss this, and Dave, you could you, uh, keep me honest on this. Uh, we, we think the next couple of months are going to be really scary in Illinois because we have corn that was dried down to uh, uh, from 26 or 24 down to, say, 16 or 15 percent dry matter. Ted Funk, our ag engineer here, argues to have a stable bin, you probably need to be down around 14 or lower on dry matter. So now we're going to have 60 degree temperatures in Champaign on Saturday. That means those cold bins of corn are going to start warming up. And we're just concerned we're going to start seeing more risks and more problems uh, with, uh, with that. So uh, we're saying really keep an eye on those bins, probably put some air through them. Uh, of course, this morning might not have been a good morning to put air in your corn bin because we had huge fog here with lots of humidity. So actually, it could have actually maybe been deleterious. So you're going to have to manage those bins carefully as far as that. That goes with it. Uh, question came up, easy to answer. Jimmy answered it for me. Uh, when will we be able to get the, these slides after the webinar? And Jimmy, in the case, he's going to post the uh, post them, and he might even sneak in those microtoxin ones that I thought were there when I practiced last night. But uh, it must be a miracle. I guess after you lose a basketball game to Wisconsin, evil things happen to your powerpoints. Uh, Tim um, raised a question. More comments on microtoxins. Uh, more, co more, co more commenting on microtoxins in Ohio and Michigan. And not so much in Pennsylvania and New York at this stage of the game. The reason we made that comment is Dairyland Labs uh, took their their results and broke them into regions, and it looked like uh, Iowa and Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin was a lot better off than. Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, and the few samples, and Tim, Pennsylvania got thrown into that one as, uh, uh, with, uh, with that one as well. So uh, there, your numbers and uh, your, your, what uh, Tim is indicating here on his message, which you folks don't get to see, is that a little bit more of a problem in Ohio, Michigan, and we heard Indiana as well. So certainly, depending on where you're listening from and what you're seeing, Tim, we appreciate those comments as far as that goes. Uh, he also added the comment, Tim, appreciate that as well that they and, and Tim's uh, associated with a, a large regional feed company, not as much success with, uh, with yeast cell uh, reported at this time uh, with that at this stage of the game. And he said that's with herds in the TMR, in the TMR uh, at 2 to 5 dawn level. So that being the total ration dry matter at this point. I don't think, David, we're seeing, to be honest with you, and maybe Dick, maybe you work with the veterinarians a little bit closer. We've not had any calls yet that appears to be attributed to uh, to the microtoxins in terms of animal health or or concerns at this stage of the game. It, it looks like um, at the, up to this point uh, we're, we're pretty healthy. Uh, any comments, Dick or, or, um, or Dave on that? Uh, I, I agree, Mike. We've not seen them. Uh, if there's some few immunity issues there that the producer's not picking up on, that could be. But basically, we've not seen the issue with the mycotoxins. Okay. Dick, any comments uh, there at this point? No, no okay. I got about the same thing. I would mention that um, Lisa's comments about making sure you got a healthy room, and because a cow can handle a lot of DON, and I know we use that as kind of a barometer for mycotoxins, particularly the other ones that may have more an impact on on health and palatability. But you know, like she said, the, the rumen, if it's really healthy, can detoxify a lot of that, especially the DON. OK. We also had a, a two other comments I think be useful to repeat at this point. And that is that uh, to be able to print off uh, the, the PowerPoints, they should be able to do that right after they're sent to you. And in fact, Jim, it looks like you've sent them already. Is that correct? Right. The people that are wrote late didn't get them. Okay, the people who got late that didn't get them. Why did they not get them, Tim? Uh, uh, Jim? I mailed them out an hour before the presentation. Okay, so Jim mailed them out an hour before the presentation. So now they'll be able to get them again after the after the. 
he will. I'll email everybody. Okay, so Jim is going to post them all online, so you can download them. And I assume there'll be a PDF. Is how you're going to load them down as a PDF. If you really have a need for those PowerPoints, and you're going to get a whole one of us crooks, because we'd be happy to share them with you. But uh, the policy has been to download them as PDFs at this stage of the game. At this point, so. Uh, so be it at this stage of the game. Uh, another comment, I'll read a uh, comment from a colleague in Texas indicating uh, that's surprising here in Texas uh, dealing with microtoxics. I think they have used some yeast products and, uh, and uh, in fact I think this person is in our class and indicated that um, th they used the yeast products uh, and had some success along with the binders. I think they used both and Annika you can respond if you wish. Uh, they said they've had at least five or six herds that they're, they're dealing with microtoxin issues as far as that goes. Be keen aware that the, the distillers grains at our meetings, uh, they have been running in the teens, uh, not uncommon to find 11, 12, 13 on distillers grains. Uh, the uh, survey uh, work that we got from uh, from uh, Rock River Labs, and I realize there are some, you know, obviously, if you go to the website, uh, you can see um, Cumberland Valley has some data. I'm not sure about Dairy One, but I went to Cumberland Labs website this weekend, and they've got some aflatoxin, excuse me, some microtoxin, not aflatoxin, excuse me, microtoxin data there. That you, can, you can go in there and take a look at that as well. But uh, just this eyes wide open here, and so uh, you can see kind of a mixed bag on the yeast products at this stage of the game. Uh, there's a question here that uh, came in from Phil. Is there a way to check microtoxin levels in the cow? And the only one I'm aware of is aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is uh, very... Uh, uh, is, is about one to two percent of the aflatoxin in in your ration is secreted in the milk. Therefore, it becomes a, a very uh, effective screen device to actually look at the uh, to to to, lo to look at what's going on in the cow. Of course, why is that important? FDA uh, monitors milk, and if it's over 0.5 parts per billion the milk, you cannot sell the milk. It must be dumped. Two years ago in Illinois, we had a problem under drought stress conditions in the St. Louis milk market, and Dave Fish and I had a couple of meetings down there with uh, amazing turnout because farmers are very concerned about it because they were having to dump the milk. That's where your clay binders can really come in and really do a nice job. The Novasil product is one of the commercial names. Has a, you can just you can just see when the guys put it in into the herd as far as that goes. We have had calls and say, well, does these microtoxins that we talked about, the Dons, the Zerolinones, the T2s, appears in milk? And to my knowledge, they do not. In other words, the FDA does not deal with them in terms of regulatory at this stage of the game. You basically are on your own. That's the beauty uh, of the... Uh of the uh, mic of, of the aflatoxin is by the time it appears in the milk, you haven't buggered up your your milk cows. In other words, uh, the, re the, the 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 limit in milk quickly creates uh, jumps into play before you get to the level that's going to have some liver impact or some effects on the fertility or perhaps even rumen health as far as that goes. So and and again, uh, Annika responded yes that they've had some success with with those products. Another question uh, coming in here uh, and that is. Microtoxins can have a cumulative effect, so it may have more challenges later this year. Comment from Glenn. I wouldn't disagree with Glenn uh, on that on that comment as well. There's also some questions about no tilling. If we're going to have more of those moles sitting out there this summer to again get us into problems, depending what our growth condition is going to be, uh, probably be a good year to bury those stocks and, and and get them under. Also, that was one of our questions raised at one of our focus meetings was: Is there some risk if we try to use corn stocks? We might have a little bit more uh, microtoxin in it. Dick Wallace, I I, I would. Think think that the answer, I would, I would think most of the microtoxins are going to be found in the grain portion of it. You might say, see some gray leaf spot and stuff like that, and Dave, you might comment on that on the forage side, but I, I, I would think that, um, you know, the grain is where the smoking gun is. Yeah, absolutely, that's correct. And obviously Dave's not going to comment as far well, as that goes. I'm with you, but I, I agree with Dr. <laughs> Lowell, so I just had you got the... Uh, we have the concentrating effects too. I think Annika's got a comment there about distillers and gluten running very high. You might con 
comment on concentration effects? Yeah, g generally speaking, on our on our distillers grains, uh, we are uh, looking at about three times what be the corn. So if your corn was five, we, we would expect the distillers to be around 15 because you're taking out about two thirds of the dry matter. It's going coming off as starch and being made into ethanol, as far as that goes. The glutens, I would think, wouldn't be quite as high because we aren't taking quite as much out of them at this point. Our distillers, we are finding about two-thirds of them are over the magic six, but we have not seen anything much higher. I don't know, Annika, if you have, but we've not seen much higher than in the teens. I think the highest number I've heard is 18. Now, if you put 10% in the ration, you can see 18 becomes 1.8, assuming everything else is clean. Notice that word, though, everything else is clean. The corn side is clean, which is probably not true if you look at that Dairyland data, and the corn is clean, which is probably not true either. I do want to be indicate that the Dairyland data and the data that uh, uh, that is going into uh, uh, Rock River and probably even uh, Cumberland Lab is pro probably biased samples, meaning farmers or veterinarians or feed companies that pick samples up because they see damage or they're concerned something's going on. So I wouldn't say 84% of the corn in Illinois is damaged with, uh, with mycotoxin, but 84% of the samples, they went to labs here in the Midwest, and I think um, uh, would indicate that they have some evidence of, 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 of amatoxin or Don in them at this stage of the game. We think the, the, the proof of, of, of wholesomeness sits with the companies that make distillers grains. And I've talked to two different companies, and they are monitoring it pretty carefully. Obviously, we can't check every load, but we are looking at... Um, at the uh, uh, range out there, and they're they're in the teens. At least that's been my take. Tim, I don't know if you've got any numbers, or, or Annika, or, or Dick, if you've seen any coming from our diagnostic lab, but uh, they're pretty much sitting in the teens at this stage of the game. So it said, if your other feedstuffs are not seriously uh, confounded or, or 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 impacted, then we should be, uh, uh, you know, we just need to be aware of them as far as that goes. Again, of course, if that corn goes out of uh, out of quality in the next couple of weeks, then that corn could be coming into our ethanol plants. And the good news is ethanol product, uh, the, the yeast seem to do a very good job with it. We saw some real crap three years ago in a, in a pile. This this was a, they took all this wet corn, put it in a pile next to the, the distillery, plant, to the to ethanol plant, and you any color you wanted was sitting in that pit. I In fact, I wouldn't even walk down in the pit because I was, I have no idea what kind of monsters were down in there. And and yet uh, the ethanol yield was a little bit reduced by it in a much, but man, and the grain coming out of that was really, really scary as far as that goes at this stage of the game. So um, at this point, I have not seen anything on corn gluten. We expect it's there, but I must be honest with you, I have not seen any corn gluten feed. Most of you will be looking at that, not corn gluten meal, uh, corn gluten feed, and, and see where that's at. Again, if the corn gluten, because it's being used for some of your sweeteners there, you might find that's human grade. And boy, the, the, if your plant is running human grade, human grade products coming out of there, then I think you can sleep a lot better at night because I would expect that corn is being monitored pretty carefully for wholesomeness. We saw that here in Central Illinois. Corn rejected at elevator A sometimes went to elevator C because of its intended use and, and, and went that direction at this stage of the game. So yes, I think they can be cumulative uh, uh, at this stage of the game. Um, We've had a comment from Annika again down in the southern part of the United States. We've had we had to request our feed companies to start testing for amatoxin. The only thing they were checking for aflatoxin, and aflatoxin always is a challenge down in the southeastern and southern part of the U.S. But you're right. I would be asking our our companies to be be testing for it. Yes, you dare can test for it. But you saw that very briefly in one of the PowerPoints. Uh, uh, some plan uh, some of the labs give you a little bit of a deal, but not uncommon to anywhere from sixty to one hundred and twenty dollars per sample if you're going to run a, a spectrum uh, on the on the uh, microtoxin. Uh, if I were going to, uh, I'm a bit of a tight Dutchman, I would probably uh, uh, look at testing for uh, a vomitoxin or Don and, and Zeralinone if you wish. I wouldn't do the aflatoxin and T2 because we're just, we're just not finding it here in the Midwest. Now maybe in Texas you still want to be doing that as far as that goes. Uh, again, uh, the question on the uh, Tim Schneider uh, contributes to the webinar saying uh, their distill is grains, they're seeing in the teens as well. So again, there, uh, just just be well aware of what, what's going on at this point. And Annika indicates they've just sent in new samples today, and by 
by the end of the week, uh, she'll know what we're doing. Uh, Dave, we may just pick up that information and send that to you so you have it for your webinar uh, just to kind of, kind of keep a pulse on that and kind of watch because, again, your webinar is going to be in a couple of weeks, and by that time, we're going to be in, in warm weather, as we'd say, by the 22nd of uh, March as far as that goes. Interesting, uh, Annika said uh, uh, they, uh, they they ran some corn gluten feed and it was higher than the distiller's grains, and that's that's interesting. I would have I would have bet a piece of pie the other direction, but Annika, I did not bet a piece of pie, and so therefore you do not get a piece of pie. They have stopped feeding the corn gluten feed. We're feeding lots of it here in Illinois because the price is, is really really pretty economical at this stage of, of the game. Uh, an earlier question came in about uh, the high moisture corn, maybe it was that uh, okay, one of our focus groups. I think they're a little bit more risky, especially as we start seeing the temperatures uh, uh, t temperatures uh, with it as far as that goes. Anyway, we had another question that came in, and I will respond to it. And uh, I, in fact, uh, can they still see our PowerPoints? Uh, we're, we're just going to, uh, you need to put me a cursor over here to get me over here on it. Uh, let, let, let's, uh, let's go to the uh, to the question on on the hot on the hot slide, and and just just a quick comment on it. Uh, this is Mike Allen's work. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I'm guessing several of you have heard this information presented by Mike or or, or at various uh, dairy seminar series because he's he's on he's on who say that he's on the chicken chicken wing trail as far as that goes with it. Uh, the hot theory stands for hepatic oxidation. Uh, a theory, hepatic oxidation theory, which means liver function. And what, what he does, he says, and he's got a great set of PowerPoints that would lead up to the one you see in front of us. He says, based on high cows, and I will let you define that any way you want, versus low cows, that you have different factors that come into play. And, and, and he says, uh, and many of them have to do with liver function. If you look at high cows, Fill becomes a real factor, and that's why you and I look at NDF digestibility and, and low lignin uh, corn size varieties and those kinds of factors that come into play there. We say they have a high demand for insulin, so the liver has to make lots, a lot, a lot, lots of glucose. Insulin sensitivity is quite low. That's a biological effect, which means the cow has less, less wanting to clear that glucose out and send it to, to the adipose tissue. And the cow, high cows, have a natural higher level of BST. So he says metabolically, metabolically, high cows are different than low cows. And you know what? I think he's right. I really think he's right. And so last year we got these big arguments about grouping cows and switching cows and drop the milk production. Yes, all that baggage sits there. But if you buy into the milk, uh, buy into the, the hot theory, then Dr. Allen would say you would build rations differently. And the high group would have these characteristics, where the low group would have the other characteristics on the right. I, th I think the only place where he and I maybe differ a little bit would be on the role of byproducts. I think strategically placed byproducts have a wonderful fit and high and high rations. You've got to be careful looking at such things as starch levels and sugar levels and RUP levels and, 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 and soluble fiber levels as far as that goes. But anyway, that's the hot theory and uh, we, we, can, we just indicate this would be another uh, arrow in the quiver, if you wish, to why you might want to be looking at a two-group system. And he really builds on the low cows because low cows fed a high-group ration really get fat because metabolically these cows have now switched into not producing milk but storing storing nutrients. And so he's saying if you've got that, how do I differentiate? I use body condition score. So if I had a cow has a body condition score of three to three and a quarter and I still have another two months or 80, 80, 90 days to go, I think we've got to get her out. we just got to get her out because Alan's data would suggest she is going to become a four on you with that kind of time, that type of a ration. So anyway, I think uh, at this point uh, we've answered all the questions. David and Dick, any comments you may have uh, at this point? Otherwise, we'll start summarizing. Oh, good. Go ahead and summarize. Okay, well, very good. Uh, you guys, uh, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate both of you being online for your comments you added here. I think uh, hopefully the, the webinar says there, there are some things that you want, we want to be some, watching out for. I think a lot of discussion on where our microtoxins are will be continue to uh, be a concern. I think our milk prices are going to force us to, stay, to be sure that we don't make some of those same mistakes last year that we talked about earlier, such as reduced hoof trimming, uh, less minerals going to feeding programs, feeding for lower levels of production. 
production. I think those are all pretty scary options that we don't want to fall back in. In fact, if our milk price continues to dawdle around here at this stage of the game. And with that, uh, our next webinar is March 22nd. Uh, Dave Fisher, uh, you will be covering stuff on forages. Is that right? Do you have any ideas where you're going with your sub webinar? Yes. Basically, we're going to try to uh, review some uh, information on input cost uh, for our forages. Maybe take a little chance to uh, compare some custom harvesting ideas as a good choice or bad choice, and then get into the whole issue of uh, density, uh, forage losses, um, and then Q and A. So um, we're going to try to really zero in on as we're getting ready now for our spring coming in. Now's the time to make those those right decisions on our forages. So hopefully it'll work well. Very good, David. We look forward to you. Uh, we thank the 43 of you that signed on. We are very pleased with a, a nice turnout here. Hopefully you've, you've gotten some value out of it. If you've got some suggestions, uh, send us some emails and, and tell us uh, w what else we could do to make this more effective. It's 1 o'clock. That's part of the, the agreement, and uh, we're going to log off. So, Jim uh, Baltz, thank you very much for all your effort to uh, to set up these webinars and, and get, us, get us online. It looked like it, it worked well, and uh, the only question I think I missed was from Ping, and uh, he indicates, uh, uh, will uh, the pH affect the, the development of the, the microtoxins? And the answer is yes, that would. And in fact, that's why some people suggest why corn silage levels, at least here in the Midwest, tend to be slightly higher than the corn grain. And uh, that may reflect uh, that uh, during that uh, three to five days that maybe Dave will talk about in the next webinar, uh, we might see some actually some enhancement of microtoxins before the oxygen is totally utilized and before we get the pH down below 4 which would stabilize and stop hopefully the development of the uh, of, of, uh, of the yeasts and, and bowls and stuff like that with it at this point and that's always a concern now again with the warm weather face management on some of our, our corn structures. With that we sign off. Jim thanks much. Have a good one folks. Hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. Have a good day.